here. Miss Henry. Here. Mrs. Maya. Mrs. Mikulski. Here. Mrs. Severino. Here. Mrs. Seltzer. Here. Mrs. Sheridan Celia. Here. Mr. Stotts. Here. Mr. Dilkus. Here. Mrs. Caden. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, there is no executive session at this time, so we will move on to section three. Uh, our Start Strong data presentation given by Mr. Yamamoto. Good evening, everyone. So tonight I'm presenting the state mandated district Start Strong report. All right, so the Start Strong was given this year on September 20th and 21st. Um, students in grades 4 through 10 um, took the Start Strong for the ELA. Uh, students in grades 4 through 8, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 um, took for the math portion. And students in grades 6, 9, and 12 took the uh, science portion of the Start Strong. Right. So basically what the Start Strong is, is that it, it gives an assessment on the previous year's um, content. So for instance, a seventh grade math student would end up taking or seeing questions from sixth grade standards. The main purpose of Start Strong was really, it's a tool for educators to help really guide their instruction. Um, I mean, that's the primary purpose of Start Strong. And just a quick note that for any data points that there were less than 10 people, that information cannot be shown. So th there, I know there's at least one slide that has, like, you'll see a less than 10 and no percentage there because there was less than 10 kids. So the Start Strong puts students in three performance levels. Uh, level three is uh, students that need less support, right? That's where we want to see our kids. Um, and all the way down to level one where students need strong support. Overall, if we uh, look at the information, so this is everybody in the district that took the test. We see that for ELA, that almost, um, or over half really needed less support. Right. Unfortunately, on the flip side, um, not quite half, but for the math and science, our students were in the strong support. This chart shows the start strong for grade level. So from ELA grades four through 10. Again, this is just representative, if you look at the, uh, the green bars, showing that our students really fell into the less support group, or the majority of them did. These are the percentages just from that chart. Again, if you look at the less support, which is in green, we see a high percentage, or the majority of the kids falling into that group. And just a quick note, as um, the grade levels increase, we do see a, a slight increase in terms of students needing strong support. But really, our kids did really well. Regarding the subgroups for race and ethnicity, we see that the black and Hispanic students are really pretty equivalent. We also do see that uh, white students had a 59% in terms of less support, so there is a, a gap between black and Hispanic and white students. Regarding subgroups for gender, we kind of fall down the stereotypical gender lines where um, females did better in ELA than males did. For accommodations, Students uh, who have an IEP, uh, majority of them needed strong support. Whereas students who either had a 504 or no accommodations um, did pretty well and they actually needed less support for ELA. Regarding the Start Strong math portion, 
Again, here's the table or a ch chart that shows the numbers of how they did from fourth grade to eighth grade and then the content levels. We see that in Algebra 1, here's an area that um, a large percentage of students really needed strong support. Again, this table just shows the percentages. And uh, again, showing the Algebra 1, a majority of students needed strong support. For subgroups, race and ethnicity, again, black and Hispanic students were pretty similar. Um, if we look at the strong support piece, white students um, was noticeably less, uh, had less students in this group. So regarding gender, in this case, um, male students did a little better than female students. And for accommodations, again, we see that a large percent of students with IEPs needed strong support, whereas students with either a 504 or neural accommodations um, needed or had less or needed less for strong support. Finally, in science, this is how uh, students in grades 6, 9, and 12 performed. As we go from the lower grades to the upper grades, we do see that um, a lot of the kids went from less support to needing more support. For race and ethnicity, again, black and Hispanic students really performed pretty similar similarly. White students, there is a gap between white students and black and Hispanic students. In terms of gender, really, male and females perform the same. And again, for a combination, students with um, an IEP, the majority of them fell under the strong support group. Right? And for 504s and no combinations, they were fairly similar. And actually, students with 504s, I would say in this case, um, pretty much outperform students without accommodations. Um, if you do add up, obviously, 504s, it says 33%. Obviously, that only comes up to 99%. But I did round in, in this table, so that's what we call rounding error. That's why you don't see 100% up there. So 1 through 5 basically is just what I stated. So that's just a summary of everything um, on the previous slides. What I do want to um, emphasize is that the Stark Strong reports were presented to all the building leaders. We did review this back in October. So we gave the test in September and we, and we shared the results in October. Um, again, because it's really a resource to help our teachers and help our kids. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yamamoto. I know that this is uh, a bit of a, a pro forma um, presentation. It's a requirement for, for QSAC and things like that. So, um, but I just wanted to, I, I appreciate the summary of findings, but could you share a little bit of what, you said the teachers got this data um, back in October. What, if anything, they, is all of this information, what, what's being done with it? So part of what's being done with it is that the Start Strong like I said, shows areas of performance. So we also, if we look at the students that had um, needed strong support, we then could target those students and focus on them because we knew that they may need more help in or certain areas. Start Strong also gives a little bit of standards information. Um, so with that information was also shared with the building leaders and um, with the building leaders. They also then went down to like PLC groups. They looked at this as well. So they could also target in terms of standards and be more aware that when we come to that standard that we may need to put a little more um, support in terms of getting them to understand what they are currently working on. Uh, did any other board members have any uh, questions before we move on? Thank uh, you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the whole a time. question about um, the uh, students with um, IEPs and 504s. Were uh, there, I guess, accommodations and modifications um, put in place during testing uh, for them? Yes, the Salt Strong um, 
assessment actually has the same accommodations as the um, NGSLA, so they did have accommodations as built in. Do you know, are we going to be required to take Stark Strong next year? Or they I hope not. Okay. <laughs> I haven't heard yet, but mm -hmm. I, I sincerely hope not. We have our own built-in benchmarks that we could really get our own data from. Um, Start Strong was a requirement from the state. Okay. All thank right. you. Thank, thank you. Now we are moving on to section four, which is our uh, committee of the whole. Can I have a motion to enter committee of the whole? So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. This is our the board's opportunity to uh, discuss more openly some uh, some topics that are not um, in, don't fall in other places on the agenda. So I let everyone know, but just for everyone else out here. The three uh, areas that we are going to talk about this evening are um, so, so give Dr. McDowell some feedback about data collection, to give an update to the culture and climate issues at specifically at the high school, and then a brief budget update, which we've been trying to do at every board meeting. So we're going to start with data collection because we just ended with a, a data presentation. And as I had said, um, you know, that was more of a, that was a statutory uh, reporting. And so we col the district collects data and reports out data for various reasons. The most productive reasons are ones that we can, that are not requirements of the state, but us using that data to analyze um, or, inf or the teachers to inform instruction, to find out um, where our highest areas of need are, for us to analyze uh, data to help us better inform the budget and where those areas of needs are, things like that. So Dr. McDowell had asked us if we could have a brief discussion here about what type of data we as a board would be looking for uh, to dig in deeper go moving forward in mainly in our committees or even in ad hoc committees about a specific topic. Um, so we will take those notes and this is kind of a, this is a conversation amongst all of us about what types of data are we looking for from, from the district to gain more information about. So you can unmute yourself <laughs> if you'd like to speak. Um, for example, during you know, the presentation, we noted like Algebra 1 stuck out. Stuck out. Like what, can we get data like down the pike to show that the improvement has been made or what's been done to like, address those specific issues? So I was thinking, in a, in a Roger, we had our, um, our board retreat on Saturday. So some of this, these topics we've already discussed at length on Saturday and are going to discuss a bit further tonight. And uh, Mr. Chu, one of the suggestions he had made was really piecing out the data in cohort fashion, right? Like, so taking the current ninth graders and following them 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, which would hopefully show us how they have how that particular group of students has progressed, not how every student that shows up in a particular teacher's classroom. So is that kind of what you're asking for? Right, just like we take this data and do something with it to show that we are trying to make strides to, you know, advance student performance. And that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Could we also um, take steps to ensure that uh, teachers are getting mean meaningful data, um, not just bombarded with charts and graphs and things like that, um, but things that they can use. Specifically thinking about how data is supporting PLCs uh, in planning and in growth is one of the things I would like to, like to see, along with, I think Chris mentioned it, but um, student growth year to year, through the year, how are, how are students growing versus what their goal was, um, not just in terms of overall um, mastery of subjects. And I should clarify, just say like, like I guess start by asking first, like if, if they're already getting good data, then all good, but just. I was also thinking of some data along the lines of, you know, in decisions that we have to make about certain things like culture and climate. So um, data in um, how various initiatives from, you know, our like restorative justice approach to discipline or progressive discipline, like what is that looking like? We've, um, we've taken away um, in-school suspension. Um, so how, what is that, 
how is that manifesting itself in the classrooms, in um, how is that affecting students, all of that kind of stuff. So, so I guess discipline data. So I was, I was going to chime in and, and, and talk about how I think there are a couple tough issues in terms of, of talk, looking at data. Um, the, f the first one is just finding the, the, the data and, and presenting it, right? And so I think a lot of what we're talking about here is, hey, um, we would like to see discipline data, you know, say broken down by subgroup to understand um, uh, maybe differences by, by subgroup. You know, we'd like to see uh, cohort level uh, student data. So what that means is, uh, you know, this class of, of, of students in, you know, the seventh grade, then next year in the eighth grade, then next year in ninth grade, the same class of students year to year to year, right? The trends in which, uh, uh, their trends in performance, right? Instead of saying, hey, this year's seventh grade versus this year's eighth grade versus this year's ninth grade, because they're, you know, different classes of students. And so finding that, that data and presenting it, I think, is, is a challenge in and of, of itself, and, and hopefully we have the systems or we can develop the systems to, to collect that information and present it. I, I think what's more maybe difficult and also as important is, in the end, we can present as many pieces of data as we have, but that doesn't lead to anything if we don't first approach it with the question of what are we asking the data to, to tell us? Why are we looking at these pieces of data? Uh, and, and what are we hoping to, to understand by looking at these pieces of data? Like, we can be told that students are, you know, strong or, or not in, in this topic. But, but why? What, what are we hoping to do with that? What question are we, are we looking to answer? Are we ask, seeing, is the question that we're looking to answer whether or not uh, uh, they have summer learning loss, whether or not um, uh, they, you know, if, we did, if you're talking about start strong assessment, right, is the question we're asking whether or not they, they lost knowledge over the summer or whether or not uh, they were prepared well in the previous year. Right? These are different questions that I think we have to first establish that we need answered so that when we look at the data, we have a frame in which we can actually understand and act upon it. Whereas I think if you just look at data in a vacuum, you can make any assumptions, you can kind of chase any rabbit down any, any hole uh, a and really look at it in a very unprincipled way. Uh, and I think that's probably the most difficult part is to agree upon and, and understand what questions we want answered um, so that when we actually look at the data, we can do something with it instead of saying, hey, that's, that's cool, right? Um, I think also a lot of times with, with data, uh, you know, um, numerical quantitative data I don't think often answers the question as to why something happens um, without, especially in, in, in a social context like schools, without also looking at the qualitative experiences of what's happening in the classroom uh, and to students, right? And that's really difficult for us as a board to get at. Um, but my point here is that I think that uh, uh, well done, uh, now, like look at the data and dig into the data by the board should lead to some important questions about why certain things are happening that can then be answered by the administration, by the schools. Um, uh, and then from there, addressed. Uh, and at the moment, I think that, that all starts with going at the data with an with initial question, initial what do we want to do with this, so we can actually end up with, with actionable questions or, or items for then the administration and the schools to follow up with. Um, sort of building off of what you just said, Roger, I would love to see how people in the schools are forming questions based on the data and then adding some qualitative data to provide some context to, to these numbers that we're seeing. I mean, I think sometimes all that quantitative data does is reinforce things like stereotypes and biases rather than lead to useful plans. So getting some qualitative data from maybe it's PLCs, maybe it's building leaders, whoever it is, what goals are being set based on this quantitative data that can help us see what's being done between now and the next assessment. I'd, I'd 
also like to add, on, and similarly, um, information outside of like our own collected data of what the test might not be showing. Um, you know, where the test itself might be biased or what we are seeing that we feel the test is not measuring. Right, does the testing actually re reflect how the children are doing in school? Yes. Maybe the pitfalls of the test. I think it, it can also help us to and I identify where things are going really well so we can further, um, we can share that information and we can make sure that it's spotlighted and really highlight some of the great things that are already happening that maybe, like you're saying, the data may not show out for all of that, but there's ways to look at it that will support some of the good things that are happening. And I think often in these data conversations, it can get into what's, be very deficit based and we want to, if we're looking at this as an asset and ways that we can continue to get better and grow and provide what's best for the students, I think just having more information can really help with that. Um, and, and then asking, is that, is this the best to help us be better? And, and to jump in on there, not to like belabor the point, but um, I think those pieces about, you know, what, um, what does the data tell us and, and, and like what can't tell us and what doesn't it tell us uh, and what is it not good for, what is it good for? That's where again, approaching data with a, with a question and a reason as to why we're looking at data will help us then understand the lim like um, limitations of the data, right? And so we're, we, can, we can say, well, we're looking at this piece of data to answer this specific question. Um, and yes, we understand that, that this test doesn't answer all our questions or doesn't do a great job of measuring this but does an, a, a decent job of measuring this, which is where our question lies. Um, because I think without that sort of specificity, uh, we can always hand wave away any sort of result that we have with tests. We can, we can just say test you know, X is, is, is trying to act this way, test, test Y is trying to act that way. Um, and so going at it with a very specific question can then let us say, well, sure, they're trying to act in these different ways, but for this specific purpose, uh, it, it serves our, our purpose. Um, and, and I think that's really important. Dr. McDowell, has this been helpful for you? Do you have any clarifying questions for us based on everything we've just thrown at you? <laughs> okay. Is there anything else about data collection, which is riveting for everyone in our audience <laughs> to listen to, um, that we wanted to add before we move on to the culture and climate update? I just want to say that I see some teachers here tonight and I think it's important that we get their perspective more than any of our perspectives because they are the ones that are, you know, analyzing the data more so than we are every day. Um, okay, so, well, yes, okay, we're good. So, absolutely good point. And um, moving on to the culture and climate update, uh, which we had shared at the reorganization meeting earlier this month um, that we, the district and the board are taking um, the need to vastly improve culture and curriculum, not curriculum, sorry, culture and climate at the uh, high school campus very seriously and that we would be um, discussing the progress that has been made and giving updates at each of our meetings. As I also said earlier, we as a board discussed this at length on Saturday at our retreat, but we wanted to uh, give everyone else um, some highlights about uh, what we discussed. So um, we know that the incident before winter break highlighted the need to reiterate the importance of creating an environment where all of our students, regardless of what their address is or what town they live in, uh, if they attend our schools, they're a Collingswood student. Um, and that was made very clear. Uh, in the weeks following the incident, there were um, opportunities for student and teacher feedback and uh, Dr. McDowell presented that to the board on Saturday. And some of the things that came up uh, were, were things like the, um, a strong need for consistency in discipline with meaningful consequences um, so that a, a student who there was an incident in a classroom does not show up in that classroom the next day and the teacher doesn't really have any sense of what, um, what went on to, to correct that incident the day before. Um, students talked about the, the need for school-based um, um, plans for emergent situations. Like a lot of them felt like what happened in the cafeteria at the high school, it, there wasn't a, it wasn't clear to them that the, the teachers and staff had a, had a clear plan for how to handle those sorts of situations. So 
um, making sure that that is clearly c communicated to everyone, along with just having clear communication when incidents occur on campus um, to both students and staff, and a, some pro providing some support to be able to discuss those kinds of things uh, as they happen or after they happen. So um, whether that be some, some training for, for teachers as well and how to kind of discuss these difficult um, topics with students or just having the space for it. Uh, De-escalation training for s staff and teachers was, um, was something else that was requested as well as students requesting training around proper social media usage since one of the, the big issues with what happened before winter break was the videoing of the incident and then the, the incessant sharing of that um, as uh, just continuing the, the, the issue. So uh, it was also shared with us some actionable solutions that are being put into effect um, right now and will continue to be throughout the school year. Things like uh, for January and February, the, um, the focus on uh, accelerating the <coughs> disciplinary action plans for non-negotiable behaviors such as profanity and vulgarity, um, verbal threats, non-compliance, um, things like that. So as I kind of said before, the, the sticking to the, the code of conduct protocols, um, making sure that there are meetings with families upon re-entry um, for an incident with uh, both families and any teachers or administrators that uh, were affected by it. Uh, additional supervision in the hallways and during uh, passing time uh, between classes and then the cafeteria during lunchtime. Uh, consistency of referrals and follow-up to that. Uh, the locked bathrooms are, have been phased out. Um, bathroom duty is being shifted to hallway supervision so that that kind of the, the band, what is being supervised is more than just what's going on in the bathrooms but in, in the hallways as well. Uh, in addition to uh, exploring other professional development that's needed like the de-escalation and classroom management training, cultural competence, social and emotional learning, restorative justice approaches, um, things like that. And then roughly, we are hoping, fingers crossed, March 2023 would be the opening of the Student Wellness Center, which would provide a lot of services um, for uh, counseling and uh, intervention services that could hopefully support some of the the culture and climate issues that we are seeing um, at the high school. Uh, so that was a very brief, I know, overview, and I know all of us sat through a much longer discussion on Saturday, so if there's anything in that that I missed or you feel like would be important to discuss or highlight further, this is, like we said, Committee of the Whole for everyone to, to chime in, so I don't know if we... Something else that we also talked about was making sure to really define more clearly define the role of school climate officers and uh, make sure that they are more visible and really um, in the hallways and, and uh, working more from a, um, a positive res restorative justice approach as opposed to just standing by the bathrooms and patrolling the, the bathrooms, that sort of thing. So again, if there's anything that I missed. And then we do have our students here who have also been living through the high school experience for the, the past couple of weeks, so I don't know if they wanted to share anything as well. You don't have to. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It was only if, if you felt compelled. That's it. I really did that good of a job of summarizing. All right. I was I'll just going to say one thing, and it was just going to be um, that um, I think you did a very good job summarizing. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say that I think that one thing is just that this is ongoing. Yeah. Um, so just that everyone understands that, you know, that it was a very brief summary, but that this conversation is an ongoing conversation and we are continuing, um, you know, striving to continue to have these conversations so that, because um, we know that there, there has to be improvements. Thank you. Yes, that is an important thing that we're, we're giving this update now. It is something that we will continue to talk about um, every month. We, you know, it is part of our new climate, culture, and policy committee, so that topic will be an ongoing discussion of the board, and I know that Dr. McDowell and the administration are working on it on a regular basis as well, but we will make sure to continue updating the public about um, what's going on as well. Uh, that brings us to budget. Um, Ms. Coleman, I was just going to ask you to start us off because I know that there are some specific dates that are important to know that I do not know off the top of my head, but I know live in your head on a, on a regular basis. So if you could just let us know kind of budget timeline of when we're going to get key, 
pieces of information that are going to inform the budget. Okay, um, so all the schools have submitted their budgets, so now I'm in the process of, obviously, consolidating everything. Um, the governor is giving his budget address on the fourth Tuesday of February, February 28th. It's usually in the afternoon. Um, and by law, within 48 hours, he has to give a state aid. So I'm assuming I'll have state aid probably by 4 o'clock on March 2nd. So just so you kind of have an idea. So February is going to be fun. Right. Um, and then uh, March 2nd, state aid. And then Collingswood is meeting on March 13th to approve the budget to go to the state for approval. And Oakland is meeting on the 14th. So we're going to have a fi fun, like, nine days in, in between there. And then I asked um, Mr. Craig if, since he is the chair of the Finance, Buildings, and Grounds Committee and is much more articulate with this sort of stuff than I am to kind of give a, a brief update of where we are and, and kind of what we want to let you know to look out for in the next couple. Sure. Months. So um, the budget process remains um, while a fun process. One of the more important things that we do as a board and one of the more important policies um, and we've, we've been informed recently that due to some of the some of the delays and some of the other coming out from Trenton and others, we don't have a full picture of all of the money that we're going to be having to work with, but we are still on track to have um, a March submission and understanding of where, um, what we will be, what our funding priorities will be for the following school year. Um, that's something that's not unique to us. That's the entire d state is dealing with that, but um, we re our number one commitment remains to providing a great educational experience for our students. Um, we want to make sure that we are funding opportunities for them to learn and thrive. Uh, but we are keeping an eye on the fiscal conversations at the state and the federal level and things that are coming up in the future to make sure that we are still providing a uh, fiscally sound uh, district and operations. It's not the most fun. <laughs> Uh, anyone else want to, I mean, we had a brief discussion as much as we could at our retreat because, as has just been shared, um, we don't have all of the information that we need, but we, you know, with the information that we have, we are working, um, or the district is working very hard to, to try to kind of make sure everything and is what's what it needs to be. What's making it worse is the audits are delayed. Right. I, that was another one so I was So I can't get about. certified tuition rates and set our tuition rates for the sending districts because... Trenton keeps pushing back the due dates. Normally the audits are due in December. I get certified tuition in January. I can set the tuition rates and I can tell Woodland what they're paying and Collins and Oakland what they're paying and we all know we're all in agreement going into March. Um, I'm lucky if I have certified rates in February at this point. Right. So, so as you I don't know state that, aid, which is uh, like 38% of your revenue, and I don't know tuition, which is about another 12. So, so a lot of information is going to yeah. come in at the same it's gonna time. It's going to come at the last minute. So yeah, mm -hmm. busy. Yes. And so trying to kind of plan for various different scenarios of guessing what those numbers might be and what that might mean for our district is basically what is going on right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unless anyone has anything else, we've we've wrapped up this portion for tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Do I need a motion to exit Committee of the Whole. And second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Moving on to section five, future dates and miscellaneous information. Just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of, um, there's the, the high school national honor society induction ceremony is this week. Uh, the middle school snowball dance is, is making a comeback uh, on January 27th. Uh, there are some PTA meetings and events and some uh, school days where school is, is closed. So just keep an eye on that. Uh, section six, routine board business. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the December 19th, 2022 regular board meeting and the January 4th, 2023 reorganization meeting. And a second? second. That's just an all in favor, right? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, we have, uh, oh, you know what? Why don't we do this? We're going to, before we get to public comment, allow the, the our student reps to give their uh, reports. So we're going to skip to section nine, student um, board reports, and then we will come back for public comment. This report um, is going to be a little bit different than normal. Okay. Um, members of the Board of Education, parents, students, and the teachers who have all gone 
above and beyond their job titles to help their students in their classrooms. We are here today not just as student representatives on the Board of Education, but as students who have seen changes in our school district over the past two years directly in the classrooms, which is an experience unique to our student perspective. The student report that we are about to deliver may be one of the most important and consequential student reports ever given to the Board of Education which is why we have taken weeks to prepare the student report in the most effective and the most professional way we believe we can that reflects the majority opinion from not just the student body, but those who make our school a place to learn and grow, our teachers. Dr. McDowell was hired by the Board of Education a few years ago because the board put their faith, trust, and confidence in him to create positive changes throughout the school district, benefiting students and fostering an education system that allows students to grow to their best selves. With Dr. McDowell's contract coming to an end next year, talks about his contract renewal will be coming up, and those talks are inevitable. It is critical that the Board of Education, parents, and students hear firsthand the general opinion from the staff of Collingswood High School and Middle School on how Dr. McDowell has been performing the past three years to ensure that there is a clear understanding of what teachers have experienced, how they feel, and what their concerns are before any contract renewal is evaluated. Over the past few weeks, we have been collecting anonymous testimony from teachers in the high school and middle school in regards to how they feel about Dr. McDowell and his performance as a superintendent. We did not collect these anonymous quotes from teachers to create an environment for drama or hostility, but to simply give the public and the board a taste of what teachers are experiencing and how the consequences of their experiences are affecting students. Teachers lack the ability to share their unfiltered opinions on what is happening within the school district and fear of losing their jobs and the respect that they have. That is why we decided to go to a range of teachers so we could get quotes on how they feel about Dr. McDowell and his performance as superintendent to protect and keep their voices anonymous. Here's all the anonymous testimony we received and I asked the Board of, Educationally, board of Education to deeply think about what it must be like to be a teacher from what you're about to hear. Uh, all the following are quotes. There is a general feeling that Dr. McDowell does not support staff, including his own administrative team. He frequently passes the blame to school admin teams while not taking any responsibility for part in decisions. Dr. McDowell has shown a lack of responsibility in what happens in the district. He washes his hands of anything that happens. He has demonstrated that he does not understand our town or climate and that he doesn't trust the teaching staff as well as the administrations in the school buildings as well as pretending to listen to students but has not demonstrated that he really listens to them. Dr. McDowell does not demonstrate the leadership, passion, or overall involvement needed. He takes no ownership or accountability in district decisions. He lies and says he had no knowledge or responsibility for decisions. He talks a good game but is never present in any way. I feel that Dr. McDowell is very detached from the school community, both students and teachers. He does not support the teachers and has no interest in doing so. I personally know of several tenured teachers in the high school who are actively looking for teaching positions outside of our district. The loss of quality educators, the loss of quality educators is avoidable, but I have little faith Dr. McDowell will do what it takes to keep them. A change in leadership can be an uncomfortable change for some. For me, it's a change I welcome with open arms. Upon his arrival, I wished the best for Dr. McDowell and wanted to see him succeed. Unfortunately, after these past few years, I don't believe this is a sentiment he reciprocated to the stakeholders of our community. On topics ranging from cuts to versus curation, playground development, promises to instructional assistance, healthcare expenditures, the budget, etc., the dialogue has seemed at times unfaithful when compared with stakeholders' experiences and facts. Perhaps of greater concern, it seems as if the district's hashtag be kind culture, the initiative that made Collingswood and Oakland public schools truly unique, has be been abandoned and replaced with a crass, sterilized, and institutional manner of engaging with students and staff. If these trends persist, I'm not confident there will be any improvements to staff morale or our collective self-efficacy, both of which are prerequisites for any successful school district. I have no faith in any decision Dr. McDowell makes for the district. It is clear he is out of touch with what staff and administration want and need. Although there are clear goal sets, who knows if they will be met. He can talk the talk, but can he walk the walk? Staff morale in the district is low. Communication is lacking. Too many committees are being made, but nothing is actually getting done. With true leadership comes the opportunity to feel confident, informed, and energized to reach a desired goal. True leaders set realistic expectations, support those who follow them, and take ownership when plans do not work out. We are void of any of these leadership traits with our current superintendent. The students benefit from having a variety of electives and courses offered to them. Eliminating courses that promote the arts and humanities will only harm student interests and involvement. Having a variety of courses benefits the students, school, and community. 
Due to an unclear com chain of commands and lack of clarity regarding protocols and resources, the morale in the district is low. In order for a school to run successfully, it is important for teachers and students to feel secure, informed, and supported. The superintendent has stated directly that he does not value people in our district, rather only positions. This was stated at a staff meeting in the winter of 2021 to 2022 school year. Unfortunately, uh, this attitude permeates this to the student body as the superintendent makes no effort to get to know the students or the culture of our buildings. For such a small community school district, he is entirely absent and removed and does not appear to value building any kind of relationships with students or staff. To me, choosing to forego these relationships is especially disappointing, particularly in a tight-knit community such as Collinswood. Every plea for support was met with blame rather than solutions, even when possible solutions were offered. The superintendent did not give us the tools we need to succeed. And that is the end of the quotes. It, it is clear that something is not working when it comes to the performance of district leadership. And it is clear specifically what is not working is the person that is holding the job, responsibilities, and role of superintendent. For over two years, Dr. McDowell has reflected fear, frustration, confusion, and irresponsibility throughout his performance as superintendent of the Collingswood School District. On January 4th of this year, Dr. McDowell held a meeting with the Collingswood High School Student Council Executive Board. Here are some of, the, some of the things that were said by the superintendent. Dr. McDowell told us that he was there to see if the school administration is doing their jobs or not, which was clearly finger pointing towards our school administration and creating a sense of hostility towards our school administration that was offensive, disgusting, and also disrespectful. He also told us that he was going to be laying down the law about discipline at the staff meeting the next day, once again pointing fingers at teachers and making himself sound like a savior of our school district, which he is not. Dr. McDowell even set up ground for tension over budget talks this year, telling us not to believe any rumors about budget cuts this year and only believe what is on the hard paper. He went on to say that while it is important that we keep teachers in their jobs, sometimes we have to reallocate resources and not everyone is going to be happy with the decisions made. I do not how know how the board members feel about this, but to me, this seems like ground is being made to once again create an environment we were experiencing last year when it came to budget talks, an environment of fear, tension, and concern. He even made sure to finish off the meeting by mocking himself as if he was a parent talking about himself, calling himself a bastard superintendent. I considered adding that quote to the teacher testimony and changing it to faculty testimony, but I decided that it was important to only share testimony from staff in our school that have a sense of what is going on in our school's everyday operations. I have been taught by some of the greatest teachers and individuals I will ever meet in my life at Collingswood, and I've learned to always speak up for the truth, to do what is right for your community, to care about others, and to never ever give up because you can do it. I ask the members of the Board of Education to do the same thing, speak up for the truth, and to do what is right for our community. Dr. McDowell's contract cannot be renewed, and if it is renewed, I am concerned about the future of the school district and the work so many individuals have done to make our school district one of the most unique and connected schools. We will continue to stand up for the teachers, faculty, and students of the Collingswood School District, and will do whatever we can to make sure people in leadership positions do not have the ability to continue and disrupt or damage our school community. We need a leader that does not point fingers at others when something goes wrong, that takes accountability, that tells the truth, and, that does, and who does not manipulate others. So with that, I conclude the student report and call on students and parents to speak up for the future of the school district. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I, your passion and your dedication to the teachers that you have clearly created strong relationships with is very clear, and um, being taught to stand up for what you believe in is a very important lesson, to, and the fact that you've already learned it is fabulous, and so uh, appreciate all of that, um, and you know, we are listening, and we hear what you're saying, um, and I'm still kind of processing. That was a lot at once, so processing all of it. I don't know that I have um, a lot to, to say at this very moment, but would like to um, always appreciate your willingness to tell us the truth, uh, or your truth, and um, hopefully we can 
continue talking and um, getting more information um, from from the student perspective. So thank you for that. Joshua. Um, I'm like this is with complete respect. Um, we did speak privately to you after the last board meeting, and a lot of what we said just now was what we told you. So um, I feel like you've had time with with respect to take in what we just said. Okay. There was there was no denying that we had spoken already. So thank thank you for that. You're absolutely right. We we had spoken and. Um, Thank you. Um, we'll move on to section seven, which is opportunity for public comment. The purpose for this public comment section is to discuss items listed on the agenda. Additional more general comments may be made later in the meeting. The public is reminded that attempts to resolve all concerns and complaints should first go through appropriate staff members and administrators. The intent of public comment is to give the community opportunity to provide feedback to the board we will be actively listening and taking notes so that we can take all that is being said into consideration. If appropriate, clarifying comments may be made at the end of the public comment section. For more detailed responses to concerns, communication may go out later in the week by the appropriate staff members or administrators or be discussed by the board during future committee meetings. If you would like to make a public comment at this time, please come and stand and state your name and address and please keep your comments to five minutes or less. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Flora Wetz Velez and I'm from Collingswood High School. I live on 728 Belmont Ave. And I'm here to speak to you today on an issue a lot of parents have been worried about, which is school security. As you know, fights have been breaking out among students as of late. And some people believe that hiring more security guards or possibly an armed guard will help resolve this issue. I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. Security guards are not preventative measures. They can only break up fights after they start, not prevent them from starting in the first place. If we really want to stop fights from breaking out in school, we have to target the core of the issue, emotion. When a student shouts at or punches another student, they do so out of anger. They do so because they feel they need to or just really want to. So if we want to prevent fights from breaking out in school, we have to help students learn to manage their emotions. No one is born knowing how to do that. Fortunately, we already have the resources at hand to do this. A mental health center is already being built in the Collingswood Library, not the Library, the LMC inside the high school, right? Okay, all right, I heard that as a rumor. I wasn't 100% sure, all right? If this is implemented correctly, it can do wonders on helping us tackle a variety of issues, not just preventing school fights. Not only that, but instead of spending money on more security guards, more money could be spent on having another licensed therapist or psychologist in the school. Because as of now, there's only one, and he's supposed to help like 200 students. It's a bit out of balance. All right. If both of the things I said are done, then school fights will happen far less often. Yes. Benjamin Zabrino Dupra. I live at 624 Lees Avenue, and I am a current high school senior. Uh, hello, members of the board and Superintendent McDowell. I speak to you today in order to relay the thoughts and concerns of both myself and students with whom I've spoken to, namely those in the Black Student Union and the GSA, on the topic of increased school security. The first thing that comes to mind for many of us when an SRO is brought up is that we would no longer be dealing with school discipline, we would be dealing with arrests. No matter how old some of us may seem, we are still kids. Saddling children with a permanent mark on their record, much less an arrest, will have drastic consequences down the line, with results ranging from difficulties in getting into college, struggling to find a job, 
or the 22% increase in probability of dropping out of high school altogether. It is worth noting that these effects disproportionately weigh on queer students, neurodivergent students, and students of color. The school already has issues with disproportionate disciplina disciplinary action taken against students of color. A meta-analysis done by the ACLU found that, for instance, black students are arrested by SROs at a rate three times higher than white students. That number becomes four when accounting only for black female students versus white female students. The information is damning. In nearly every metric, SROs get skewered by a litany of flaws and weaknesses. That being said, there's another way that we could prevent conflict in our schools. I've gone to Collingswood Public Schools my entire life. The first fight that I saw in the high school was scary, but the students that I saw get into that fight were just that, students. They were children who didn't know any other way to resolve their, resolve their conflict. Having more dedicated social-emotional counselors would, would provide students with more opportunities to learn skills that will not only help them prevent conflict in school, but also outside, all without staining their future through arrest. Mr. Adams is an excellent counselor, and it is clear to anyone who talks to him just how much he cares about the students that he works with. But from a purely numerical standpoint, he is outmatched by the 2,264 students that currently study in this town. Too often, students must be turned away in moments of crisis because the school is not properly staffed to handle a growing population of students who have only recently come out of a widespread quarantine. Rather than spending the taxpayers' money on something that, the ve that at the very best will not help the problem and at its worst will exacerbate it tenfold, let us choose rather to invest in a service that will help students resolve conflict themselves while better utilizing our current security force to protect students in a worst-case scenario. The work that a social-emotional counselor does can have a ripple effect that reverberates through, throughout the school environment, and all it takes is one poor choice made by an armed SRO to leave a student wounded, or worse, dead. Today's students walk into classrooms that are drastically different than the ones 10, 20, or 30 years ago. We see a rising tide of reports of depression, anxiety, and trauma, and little to no response from the state. These students need help. They need someone to teach them the social skills that were never enforced. They do not need an officer of the law, armed gunmen in schools, peering down at them, not as students, but as potential criminals. They do not need more surveillance. They do not need a panopticon watching as they pass through the halls. Our students de deserve better, and so do our staff. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Fox, 509 South Vineyard Boulevard, Collingswood. I don't really have much to say. Well, I have a lot to say. It would take me much more than five minutes, but what I want to direct my speech to is Aiden and Riley. I am super impressed. You keep doing what you're doing. You are amazing, awesome individuals who learned a little bit from your parents, your guardians, Dr. McMullen, because what does he talk about in middle school? What else? Your grit. He talks about grit. Who has grit in this room? Who has it? You two. You keep it up. You do what you're doing. I am so proud of you. I wish I was related. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> you keep it up. I am so impressed because this is Collingswood. You two, I'm emotional right now because you two just demonstrated to this entire room what these students at Collingswood are all about. And I love it. Great job. Trey Ramsburg. I live on the second apartment of 32 East Coulter Avenue. Uh, hello, board members. I am a student at CHS, and I'm also here to offer something of a pushback against the trend the student body has noticed in reaction across, ta and ac across town to recent events. There has recently been some serious talk among many parents and teachers I know about getting CHS a school resource officer for an SRO, an armed police officer to guard the school and handle emergencies. I'm speaking now to explain why I, as a student and as a member of this community, don't want that. Firstly, I want to very briefly detail the process social scientists call the school-to-prison pipeline. The basic idea is that punitive school discipline, like suspensions, increases the likelihood of dropping out many times over. High school dropouts are unlikely to hold down decent jobs and are much more likely to go to prison than graduates. Also, intuitively, all that happens when a misbehaving, immature student drops out is putting mis misbehaving, immature person into a is putting a uh, misbehaving, uh, immature person in the real world. That's no way to produce productive members of society. I bring this up because it very disproportionately affects people of color, especially black and Latino men, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ, involving 
the police would only exacerbate the devastating effects of punitive school discipline on these very vulnerable communities. It would turn the pipeline into a valve, not even accounting for the fact that these people are more likely to have pointless run-ins with the police anyway. We solve no problems and only make bad things worse. In fact, these same groups are the ones most likely to be involved in violence. These are the people the SRO would be supposed to protect, but I doubt they'd feel safer. The American Civ Civil Liberties Union says that when teenagers interact with SROs, which we do every day, can lead to depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other mental and physical health issues. Instead of making things worse like this, what the school should do, if anything, is put its resources to better use. Violent conflicts don't spring up out of nowhere. They are the culmination of complicated interpersonal conflicts and fight and fights often seem and fights are often seen coming from a mile away. Better access to mental health services in school or peer mediators would allow people to settle conflicts and learn strategies to de-escalate and resolve the problems without a fight ever happening. Even though teens have been steadily committing fewer crimes since before SROs ever became prevalent, youth arrests have skyrocketed to the point that if there's an SRO in a school, there's almost quadruple the arrests. That puts troublemaking kids behind bars entering the prison system before they're old enough to shave. The real, effective solutions are a lot less simple than just putting a man with a gun in our school to lock up the bad seeds. Hard, complex problems can't be solved simply. It's worth it for me and my classmates, among whom are people of color, disabled students, and LGBTQ students, to invest our resources into things that would make things better. I wouldn't feel safer with an SRO, and I know that I wouldn't be. We're immature kids. Schools are places of learning, not for being surveilled like we're already criminals. Is the shallow, superficial sense of security we get worth the $46,500 a year? Why not actually make progress for our kids and their future? Good evening. My name is Nick Franklin. I live at 732 Ritchie Ave in Oakland. I've been an attendant. Uh, I've been attending uh, Collingswood school systems basically since the beginning of my life. Uh, and with all this talk of an armed SRO, I feel like I very much would not be safe in such an environment. As fellow students have previously mentioned, uh, SROs have been known to disproportionately target students of color. And being one, I feel like this would be a uh, this would be very detrimental to my experience and my safety as a student here at Collingswood. Is when I think about Collingswood, I think about the ability of a town, a small town, to get together and to solve our problems without the use of the threat of violence that comes with having an armed officer in the school. And I think that hiring more security officers per se might not be the solution because it presents the same problem. The threat of the use of force does not actually substitute for a community, uh, community ties that may prevent the violence in the first place. And I think that putting uh, more security officers, armed or unarmed, frankly, would be a detriment not only to me as a student, but to many of my classmates and to future generations. Because one day we'll have kids and they'll be going to these schools that may or may not have armed officers within them. I feel like a situation like that will harm Collingswood for many, many years to come. So I beg you, think not only of our generation, but of the generations after us. Do not put armed officers in our schools. Hello, my name is Dashiell Career Fisher. I live at 1017 Eldridge Ave, and I am a sophomore at uh, Collingswood High School. I have a written response here um, regarding SROs and safety, but I also have uh, another thought about, you know, if we exclude SROs, how would we combat less fights? So I'm going to read what I have written first, and I'm going to read what I was thinking earlier. So. SROs have proven to increase behavioral incidents and spike sus suspensions, expulsions, and arrests. It is well known by school psychologists that students who feel they belong in the classroom perform better. Unfortunately, an SRO present on campus makes students, especially those of color, feel the opposite. 
They neither feel welcome nor safe on campus. Plus, they did not perform as well as their white classmates. SROs also increased the number of students who are criminalized. Also, also, SROs have shown in the past to not prevent school shootings. Funding a cure that doesn't work is as detrimental as doing nothing at all, if not more. Funding for more mental health services is a better option overall to prevent anything bad from happening in the school. In Washington State, in the district of Spokane, they have collectively spent more than $1 million for SROs, but as we can see in Texas, regardless of SROs, 160 incidents, including 23 shootings, have occurred. That money could have been used for better mental health service needs. Also, personally, I would feel very uncomfortable if a person with a gun wandering the, is wandering, wandering the halls of our school, no matter how qualified they are. SROs know nothing about the students and their personal issues. They do not provide the protection that is sought for. So the only thing they provide is fear. Uh, a man walking the hall with a gun making students feel like they are in prison makes us all feel guilty. We're not on a road checkpoint. There's no reason to suspect us of crime or anything like that. Funding for SROs does not override funding better mental health services. SROs will negatively impact students men mentally and academically. This is a school still and not a prison. And then what I was thinking um, was that I heard that there was going to be a mental health uh, room in the LMC, and I'm very happy to hear that. But another thing about the, the climate of not just our school but everywhere is that mental health is stigmatized, and people that have issues are often looked down as as you know being this dangerous person. But we can prevent the danger if students know that it is okay to feel bad sometimes, and that not only we have counselors, but we have counselors that can understand and provide empathy with the students and make, make them feel like they belong in the school district and not make them feel like an enemy of everyone else. And so I think those two could correspond, and that's all I have. My name is Sarah Mervine. I'm a school nurse at Collingswood High School. As of tonight, I'm eight years of my tenure. Um, I have submitted my resignation, but before that happens, I just wanted to share. And uh, before you approve your new high school nurse by default, um, I am the mom of three boys, two of which are teenagers, and I went to Collingswood since the sixth grade and graduated from Collingswood High School, and I started my family here. Um, I actually took care of Jasper when he was between me and the NICU. And I've done a great job with him. <laughs> um, I am very embedded in this community, going here since sixth grade, starting my family here, and I have absolutely loved being their high school nurse, more than I could have imagined, starting out as a NICU nurse and spending 23 years here. I'm sure you can imagine the immediate gratification um, from the moms just for you to be nice to them. On Dashiell's note about the mental health clinic, which is supposed to be opening, I have serious doubts about the form that it's that's starting, how it's being laid out, the fact that a student doesn't even know that it's going to be happening and the rollout is less than 60 days away. Um, my doubts are because um, I wasn't involved at all in any of the planning of it, and I am the person that they came to and they confided in, and the person that helped them to realize that the stigma can go away as their feelings are validated. Um, my resignation did not come without a very heavy heart. It was met only after multiple attempts of asking for more support in the nurse's office. I did um, have an opportunity to talk to Dr. McDowell before this grant was awarded, and he was very receptive to me and asked me to send him an email with my plans, and unfortunately we weren't able to elaborate more or plan more um, any time in the near future after that. Um, we tried to meet several times since September of this year, knowing we were two years late after the pandemic and the parallel mental health uh, epidemic that was happening alongside the COVID pandemic. Um, Dr. McDowell did ask me to reconsider my resignation when we finally did get to meet in December, and I just want all of you to know that I did not resign because I already had another opportunity. I wasn't looking for another job. This was my dream job. And this district lacks sustainability. Most nurses, a school nurse job is a dream job, and they take these jobs and they stay in their jobs until they retire, and you are on your third nurse a very qualified, dedicated, 
committed nurse to this community because I can't do it by myself. And the wellness center is two years late. And the kids that it will likely help are in elementary school right now by the time a program like that will come to fruition the way it's being designed as of right now by people who haven't been meeting with the kids. The people who are designing it are people who are already meeting with kids who have IEPs and 504s and therapists and medications and help already. The kids that really need the mental health support are kids that are not already meeting with those people. So I just came tonight to let you know that I did not want to leave. I love this job. I'm only leaving because I can't do it by myself. And after multiple attempts of asking for support, I was met with nothing. I also have a supervisor who does not have any medical background. And after being a nurse for 24 years, having somebody be in charge of me and question me about what I'm doing all day with the multitude of students that are visiting is quite frankly insulting on a very high professional level. To have an administrator who has taught, who has led a school, who has been a principal question what I'm doing in the nurse's office is unethical, irresponsible, and ridiculous. And that's how it's always been done. And that is the answer that I get when I pose several solutions to a lot of problems is, well, that's how we've always done it. And in the medical field, I don't know anybody that's going to the hospital that says, I'd like you to do it the way you've always done it, not the better way. So that's all I got. Sue Angelucci, 130 Woodland Terrace, Oakland. Um, excuse me while I read from my notes. Uh, I am here to talk about uh, agenda item 11.12, the request to hire professional to revise the current secondary schedule. I have three questions that I know won't be answered and then I have something to say after that. Um, question one, will the same rigor be present or is there a plan to reduce the graduation requirements? Two, will the new schedule include students' input, which uh, highlighted a greater variety of electives to support career readiness? Three, um, isn't there a full committee of staff that is more than competent to create an effective schedule without wasting uh, school money on an outside source? Secondary parents are hearing that there is a plan unsupported by staff and students to decrease the rigor that makes our district unique, which will essentially reduce the amount of classes and limit options, reducing credits, and the amount of classes students take on a daily schedule will not benefit any growth for our children and will ultimately reduce staff. Good evening, Heather Hackle, 439 McGill Avenue. I'm back. I spoke at December's board meeting, and I'm just going to give you a little update since the last time I spoke to you all. I heard from one incoming board member, a student representative, and Dr. Ostroff right after meeting in the foyer. I never heard from you, Dr. McDowell. Not a phone call, not an email, nothing. After I addressed you and the board, at this meeting in December about our son being bullied at the high school. I move on. On tonight's main theme, earlier there was a lot of talk about data and what and how our students are being taught. I agree that data is important. However, before you really dive into that learning that is or is not happening in our school, take a deeper dive. Take a deeper dive on school climate and culture. Until this board and this administration admits there's a climate, morale, culture issue in our specifically high school, our teachers can't properly teach, our students can't properly learn. During any test or quiz, if a student's worried about what may happen in the hall or bathroom or cafeteria, you can throw that data out the window. It's not going to be accurate. It's not going to be valid. Bottom line, we shouldn't be worried about getting jumped. That is a quote from my son before going to bed one night. Because since the Hib 
that happened in the fall, a couple weeks ago, he was slapped in the face for no reason. He went to bed that night saying, Mom, I hope I don't get jumped in the hall. Is my son learning the next day? He's not. And he's a student that's up there in the IP section of that data that you call. Again, they shouldn't be worried about what bathrooms will be open and available or functioning or if there's going to be a fight in the hall or cafeteria. Don't get me wrong, school fights have been around for as long as public school's been around. The difference is the premeditation that's happening and the fact that these fights are now easily live streamed right on our social media almost immediately. Our students and teachers deserve better. There's a reason this room is filled with teachers and students and parents. And it's not to see the Start Strong data or to hear you ask what we are doing with that data. We are here because our students and teachers don't feel safe and or supported. Take a deeper dive into the climate and culture because there's a reason why they did this and why they did this. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else come up and did want to take a minute to echo what Ms. Fox said earlier about um, what Collingswood students uh, can show us and I think our student board reps did that but so did all the students that just came up to speak so eloquently with uh, research to, to back up their claims um, that should be applauded as well so thank you for um, continuing to, to speak up for the things that you believe in because that is exactly what Collingswood is all about. Uh, with that, we are going to move on to Section 8, the Superintendent's Report. Okay. So good evening, Section 8.01. Um, enrollment December 2021 was 2,259. As of December 31st, 2022, uh, 2,299 with the uh, reports attached. 8.02 is the school safety report that is also attached. 0.03 uh, is the suspension. 0.04 is the anti-bullying. And we have two announcements uh, that we would like uh, to share this evening. First, uh, for the first time ever, Collingswood High School is proud to announce that 11 seniors will be receiving the New Jersey State uh, Seal of Biliteracy Award. Uh, this award recognizes students that are proficient uh, in another language in addition to English. And we have 11 students that will be recognized in the languages of Spanish and Russian. And these students will receive a certificate with the seal insignia acknowledging their accomplishment during graduation. Uh, Pre-K and kindergarten registration, we're excited to share that uh, we are beginning to plan for 23-24 classes. Families will receive the registration process for kindergarten and the preschool lottery this week. And preschool lottery applications will be found on the district's website beginning Tuesday, February 21st. Uh, in addition, we appreciate uh, the community's help um, expanding the reach of our programs in the Collingswood community. If you have any friends or neighbors with children of kindergarten or preschool age, please encourage them to contact Ms. Lisa Pendarvis or the school district's website. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, we had our student report earlier. So section 10, the business administrator board secretary report. All right. Um, so this evening in item 10.01, I have a listing of your December uh, monthly transfer reports. And 10.02 is your board secretary, treasurer, and cash reports. 10.03 is your student activity cash report. 10.04 is your food service financial statement. 10.05 is your January purchase orders that have been issued. And in 10.06 is the uh, list of warrants to be paid tomorrow morning upon approval. And just, uh, I know I mentioned it in the committee of the whole, update on the audit. Probably when it's done, um, the auditor is obviously swamped, so I'll probably be presenting the audit on behalf of the auditor, hopefully in February. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Section 11, Buildings, Grounds, and Finance Committee, Mr. Craig. The Finance, Buildings, and Grounds Committee reviews all financial statements, purchase orders, and warrants on a monthly basis. The committee also reviews and approves all contracts with outside service providers and oversees all maintenance and capital improvement projects district-wide. Um, 
not a ton on here, but 1102 to 1109 is the approving the board secretary's report. Uh, 1110 uh, is acceptance of the building capacity grant, which again was for those who need to refresh, was won last year um, and is to help us build out the engineering, further build out the engineering program at the high school. Um, this is just a form to accept it. Uh, 1111 is uh, approval of ESSA Title I um, carryover amounts in Title 1A, 2A, and Title IV. Uh, 1112 is the RFP for scheduling services to uh, help with the creation of the master schedule. Um, this is just a request for proposals um, and no, nothing, nothing, this will need to see if any of those services are available. And then 1113 and 14 are translation services and rates for the rest of the school year. Um, and seeking approval from items 11.2 to 11.14. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve those items? And a second? Second. Uh, questions or comments from board members? Hi, I would like to address um, a concern, uh, go back to what you said about approving uh, a new master schedule. Can you just explain that a little bit more, please? It's, it's a request for proposals to see if we could get any support from what we to, with the creation of this. When we understood there was a resignation for somebody who used to be heavily involved in the creation of the master schedule, so this was to see if we could bring in some extra capacity. This person, from my understanding, would not be creating the schedule on their own. This would be through input with teachers, administrators, students, and the other information. So this is the request for proposal. We would still have to approve any. So it's not hiring anyone right now. It's just asking for if there's anyone out there who does these sorts of services that could provide support for the district. So we're not, there's, there's no hiring of a master schedule tonight on the agenda, if that helps. Yeah. I clarify, clarify a little we, more we too. We haven't reached oh. out to all the staff that may be interested in that potentially yet, or we have. Have we reached out to the staff in terms of like if they are interested in, in helping design the master schedule or are we just going for this like plan, plan I, based? I think it's a different scenario. So, but so there is a um, there is a committee um, that is currently meeting with the high school and middle school administration in order to help uh, discuss and co-construct the schedule. Um, what we um, are hoping to create is an opportunity to provide additional support should the school need technical assistance. What happens is is with the schedule is you have a an ideal structure. And then you, you have to pair that and merge it with the request that come in from the students. And so, and then once that happens in the computer system, then there's a series of conflicts that have to be resolved, and then you have to move things around. And so traditionally, um, the district supervisor for counseling services worked really closely with the counseling department and administration in order to facilitate that. Um, she will be leaving us. And so uh, as a, uh, a, a stopgap measure, in her absence, we wanted to make sure that if the schools were in need of that technical assistance, we had services in the ready to be able to provide them so that that doesn't delay the building of a schedule until her replacement comes. Okay, so this is, this is um, more or less a proposal just to explore that possibility. Correct. Okay. Correct. Can I ask another question on that topic? Um, so this would not be an ongoing uh, high, uh, that this would not ne necessarily be an ongoing thing that we would be using, utilizing. It was because we had an unexpected resignation and we don't want students to be left without the possibility, like no schedule kind of a thing because we don't have someone to do that scheduling. Correct, our primary goal is to make sure that um, students and staff have the master schedule in place before everyone goes home for the summer. And so in order to be able to do that, um, the school may or may not need additional technical assistance with that process. Okay, and then just one other, and, and the hiring or the request for proposal of this uh, scheduling person in no way indicates um, a lessening of credits or anything like that. that is, this, we're not indicating anything like that of a master schedule, right? <laughs> On this agenda right now, no. That is I, not what I haven't. Doing. I haven't drafted the RFP yet. But so I'm saying that is, not what is, that is not being put out there right now, correct? This is simply a request for proposals to see if a, to help so someone who has expertise in the master scheduling programming could potentially help us out for this year. Nothing has changed is what I'm trying to get at, right? 
in scheduling students other than the person that used to do it is no longer going to be here. And that's why we have this. That is my understanding right now. I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. Further clarify, the reason it's on the agenda is I anticipate if I think a service is going to be more than um, my quote amount as the purchasing agent, you know, I have to make sure I, I go out and get a formal proposal um, to bring back to you. So that's kind of why it's on here also. Instead of just going out and calling people and say, hey, can you do this? I have to go through a formal process. I, I just want to make sure that we are, um, you know, communicating with the high school and or the secondary admin and the secondary and the committee of that is taking care of this, that there's no one there that is interested in taking on this lead role or has the ability to take on this lead role that Ms. Taylor is not going to have anymore. So this level of support will be um, at the request of the school. And so the school principals were alerted that we were doing this as an additional opportunity to, pr to have the ability to provide support if they needed it. And so currently the committees that are meeting are made up of administrators and teachers. They're actually helping to develop the schedule. Um, but the actual building of the master schedule, the rostering and all of those would be what uh, may or may not require additional hands. And so we wanted to make sure that if they needed additional hands, we had the ability to provide them. Have the high school faculty who have been helping to develop the schedule, have they been asked if they need outside support? Because I assume you're talking about someone being brought in from the outside. Have, have they been asked whether that is necessary? It's been an ongoing discussion, and so we're in close talks with the uh, high school and the middle school administration to figure out what their needs are. And if their needs change, um, we want to be in a position to provide support. Any other questions or comments from board members? Um, I feel like we should table this discussion. I'm just going to ask to table it. I don't know if I can uh, say yes to that or, or not tonight, honestly, with the information that I, that I have. Specifically just for the request for proposals? So not even to go out for the request for proposals. Okay, if so yeah. we would have to put that to a vote. I would need a formal motion uh, in a second to table the I item, and then we would vote. I guess I'm, I'm confused about what the issue here is. Uh, we're, we're being asked to authorize asking whether or not there are uh, appropriate services to help us create, do the technical work of creating a master schedule. And so unless there's other subcontexts that I'm missing, we're not even approving someone to be doing anything here. We're, we're saying, hey, are there services we're giving uh, 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 Beth, the, the Beth and the uh, flexibility to then ask us if needed to approve someone's work uh, to do the scheduling. So I, I guess I, I'm confused as to what the the, the issue is is here with with this uh, agenda item. I mean, it's a two-step process, right? We we approve to go out to bid, but we don't necessarily have to correct. approve those bids. That is correct. Come in. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So, I mean, if you would like to make a motion to table that item, you can do that. Uh, I just feel considering um, some of the public feedback we just got, um, it, th this just seems like um, something that I think I would just like to hear a little bit more about before um, even we put out the proposal. So th that's, that's all I was wondering. If I, and I would tend to agree with Kelly that perhaps we need a little bit more um, information because I know some of us were discussing, I, I guess this is a little bit more technical than, than maybe we had understood before, just by reading the agenda before we got here tonight. So the master scheduling component is always done in partnership with the school. The school determines the parameters. So for example, um, the middle and the high school are looking to increase the amount of time in content. And so uh, there is a, an acknowledgement that 41 minutes is too, is too short a period. And so they're trying to strike the right balance in what they believe is the right amount of time. They're also trying to add additional time into lunch. They're trying, they're attempting to add additional time into passing in order to give students a bit more time if for socialization and going to and from. And so once that has been determined, um, an entity, if an entity came in from the outside, they would be working hand in hand with the two schools in order to do the technical part, which is making sure that students are rostered into the courses and the structures that the schools have identified. And so they're not, they're not creating a schedule by themselves. 
they're, they're in essence doing the data entry and making sure that the, the amount of time works in the system and so that students are able to get the choices that they've indicated and that teachers are, are scheduled appropriately aligned with our uh, collective bargaining agreement. Just out of curiosity, I know that the school, this is not the only change that the school district has ever had. Um, have we ever needed an outside company to do this before? I don't think so. Okay. I've been here. I'd like to table it then. I'd like to make a yeah, motion to table it. Know. So then you have to, you just have to say, you, so you're making a motion to table. Correct. Item. Um, I, don't, I don't know what item it is off the top of my head. I believe it's 11.12. 11.12, okay. Motion okay. table 11.12. So, so there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, so then roll call, correct? Yes. So you're voting on whether or not yes or no to table that motion. To table that item, excuse me. Mr. Chu. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Henry. Ms. Maya. I'm voting yes to table it. Mrs. Mikulski. Yes. Mrs. Severino. No. Mrs. Seltzer. No. Ms. Celia. No. Mr. Stotts. No. Mr. Dokus. No. Mrs. Caden. No. Item is not tabled. So then uh, we are, we don't need to redo the motion then, correct? Because it's all the same. Okay, uh, so any other questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Maya? No. On the whole agenda? Or I'm sorry. Yeah, just, just, just <laughs> I just want to make sure just on, ju on just that item. I'm going to say uh, yes to everything, um, and I'm going to abstain from that 11.12. Uh, Thanks. Mrs. Mikulski? Uh, yes to everything except 11.12, please. Got it. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Mrs. Seltzer? Yes. Mrs. Sheridan Celia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mr. Dilkus? Mrs. Caden? Yes. Thanks. Moving on to Section 12, the Curriculum Committee, Mr. Chu. Good evening. Uh, the Curriculum Committee oversees and improves the district curriculum and assessment programs as well as field trips, home instruction, co-curricular programs, and the school calendar. Uh, for today's agenda, I think it's mostly uh, field trips, so items 12.0, uh, 12.0, uh, sorry, 12.02 through 12.04 are about field trips. Uh, so just a, a quick, uh, I guess, um, description of them. Uh, at the elementary level, let me see if I can pull this up correctly. Uh, they are uh, field trips, uh, to go see um, both the, I think the middle school performance of Once Upon a Mattress and also uh, for a newbie to go to the Museum of American Revolution in Philadelphia. Oh, the high school, oh, the high school music, but yeah, but at the, at the, at the middle school, there you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's uh, some uh, overnight trips for Mao Yuen, uh, which I'll just mention, I loved when I was a kid and loved the overnight trips. Uh, but also indoor guard uh, percussion and, and marching band. And then there's also several uh, uh, high school uh, indoor guard percussion, I guess, competitions that they're asking for permission uh, for. And also I think another uh, modern museum of art in New York uh, trip. Uh, and then 12.05 is some uh, uh, out of district and home instruction placements. Um, and that is it. So I guess, uh, asking for approval on items 12.02 through 12.05. A uh, motion to approve those items. So moved. And a second? Uh, questions or com <laughs> I don't know who said it first. Uh, questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Mrs. Maya? Yes. Mrs. Mikulski? Yes. Mrs. Severino? 
Yes. Mrs. Seltzer? Yes. Mrs. Sharon Ocelia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mr. Dilkis? Mrs. Caden? Yes. Moving on to section 13, the personnel commi committee, excuse me, Ms. Sheridan Celia. Uh, the personnel committee reviews all recommendations for teaching and staff employment, considers co-curricular employment, and considers all professional development opportunities for staff members. Item 13.02 is a resignation, 13.03 is an intermittent leave request, 13.04 is the appointment of a speech and language specialist, 13.05 is an SEL coach, and actually 13.05, 13.06, and 13.08 are all uh, seeking approval for appointments due to the wellness grant. 13.05 is the SEL coach, 13.06 is the secretary, and 13.08 is the project evaluator, and they're all made possible by this great grant. 13.07, which is in between, is the appointment of an LDCIC. I'm sorry, I can't read C. Um, sorry about that. 13.09, the appointment of a high school special education teacher. 13.10, a high school long-term sub replacement teacher. At 13.11, another long-term sub, a long-term math sub at 13.12. 13.13 um, 13 is the appointment of elementary lunchtime and playground assistants. 13.14 um, through 13.19 are revised contracts. 13.20 is a transfer, 13.21 is a child study team assignments, 13.22 psychology interns, 13.23 substitutes and tutors, travel and expense form at item 13.24, and uh, I'm seeking approval of items 13.02 through 13.25. Is there a motion to approve those items? I'm sorry. Hang on. So 13.24. Yeah. Motion to approve items 13.02 to 13.24. So moved. And a second? Second. Questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Mrs. Maya? Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Mikulski? Yes. Mrs. Sabarino? Yes. Mrs. Seltzer? Yes. Mr. Sharon Celia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mr. Dilkis? Yes. And Mrs. Caden? Yes. Moving on to section 14, the Culture, Climate, and Policy Committee, Ms. Severino. Uh, Culture, Climate, and Policy Committee reviews all updates and changes of district policies and regulations. So tonight there is uh, one policy that is up for a second read. Um, it is policy 5112, the entrance age uh, policy, which just uh, solidified some of our entrance age, the policies for entrance age to our various uh, grade level bands. Um, so seeking approval for item 1402. Is there a motion to approve this item? So moved. And a second? Second. Questions? I apologize. Questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Mrs. Maya? Yes. Mrs. Mikulski? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Mrs. Seltzer? Yes. Mrs. Sheridan Celia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mr. Dilkis? Mrs. Caden? Yes. Um, moving on, there's uh, no HIB report uh, for this month, so moving on to Section 16 is our second opportunity for public participation. You all heard my spiel at the beginning, so I'm not going to reread it, but um, please stand and say your name and address and keep your comments to five minutes or less uh, if you would like to speak. Heather Hackle, 439 uh, McGill Avenue. Thank you for questioning why we are going to outsource. Please continue to question why we would outsource a company to help us build a master schedule. I've been a principal, an assistant principal, and a director of counseling for much larger districts than this one, and we've never, ever outsourced or gotten outside help and paid for the building of a master schedule. It comes from the leadership you hire to have that. If they are not trained, 
to build that properly, they have a committee. I hear there's a committee. That's great. It's up to your building leadership to do this. If they can't plug it into Genesis, and Genesis, by putting the modules in Genesis, just you push a button, it spins. It tells you the percentage of students that have the correct. You could be 75% of your students got what they elected. You could be 90% if you're really lucky. It's a push of a button in Genesis. And if we need assistance with Genesis, the person that's leading should onboard the other people on the committee to do this. We should not be paying money that we don't have to outsource to build a master schedule. Please continue to challenge that. Thank you. Rick Pence, President of the Commons of Education Association. For some clarification for our Board of Ed members who are not sure on what we're talking about, we are involved in a committee right now to deal with scheduling. That committee is a negotiated committee that the school board negotiated with the association. So that's what that committee is about. There's never been any uh, outsourcing to help this committee. I was involved when we switched from an eight period day back in 08 uh, to the schedule that we did and continued through that on that. We are asking that we continue to negotiate with administration on developing a schedule for next year and follow the language that your predecessor's Board of Ed has negotiated with the association so we can put something forth. I will tell you, the previous negotiations was sitting with Board of Ed members talking about a schedule in the high school. I'm sure this Board of Ed does not want to get back to that type of negotiations because the experts are sitting on that committee. They are. Thank you. Can I ask you a quick, can I ask you a quick clarifying question um, for, for myself? Because I think I'm hearing negotiate. So you're not talking about a negotiation committee with us because I we've been a part about of that. What, what was can you explain to me what you mean by a negotiation what was, committee? What was negotiated previously? In, in with the, the contract. With the contract. Uh -huh. But then there's the also a committee happening right now. And is there's that right? a committee is happening right now with administration yep. on developing a schedule. Mm -hmm. And we are sitting at the table. Right. Uh, matter of fact, hours ago I was discussing this. Uh, and in the next few days we'll be even discussing this more deeply on top of that. Okay. And this committee is happening. And we are jointly meeting with administration from the high school and middle school to try to figure out a schedule that is happening currently right now. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Hi, I'm Pam Gesher. I'm at 115 Crestmont Terrace. Um, and I just want to say I'm totally impressed with all the students that spoke um, and completely support them. And Dr. McDowell, this I really is to you, and I'm hoping that the board took notice of this. I work in education, and I am appalled that as the leader of our district, that nowhere in your, your, your superintendent's report did you thank them for participating or acknowledge that they spoke, and that the poise and courage that it takes for them to come up and give the feedback that they did, man, props to them and props to every single one of their teachers. I recognize as a human, if I were you, it would be difficult to hear that, but nowhere did you say, Thanks for the feedback. I'm going to take it to heart. I'm going to take it back. And I can see why, the admit, why your staff feels like you don't support them. Because for them to get up here and say all that to you and have zero recognition from you blows my mind. So you hardly even looked at Aiden and, and Riley when they were speaking. So I just wanted, I hope all of you as a board that you, that you recognize that and you saw that as well. Hi, my name is Tom Howard. I work. I, uh, I live at 16 Fraser Avenue. Uh, I am a parent of a second grader at Tatum. Um, I'm also an educator. I work in a different school district in a different high school. And I, I want to say I'm really concerned about some of the comments that staff here have made. Uh, I was really taken aback by the uh, resignation of the school nurse uh, after being such a dedicated employee. And what really makes me concerned is that I, I can't get into details, but morale where I work is awful. Teachers don't feel supported. Teachers are actively trying to leave. 
And I'm worried that this is happening and going to happen at this district if the board doesn't take active measures to support their staff um, in a real meaningful way. And so as a parent and as an educator, I really am concerned. We came to Collingswood uh, for the town, but also for the schools. We heard great things. And now we hear that teachers are disgruntled, teachers are scared, and teachers are leaving. And it really makes me question um, now why I came. And I don't want to question that because I want my kid and all the kids here to have a great education. And part of that has to do with the staff feeling supported and cared for. And I don't want the staff here to feel like many of us feel at my, my district and my school. Thank you. My name is Maggie Jamieski. I live at 258 Woodlawn Avenue. Uh, my comments are very off topic, so I apologize, but I worked up the courage to get here, so here I am. <laughs> um, I have three children that attend Tatum School. I'm currently the PTA president. I'm standing here tonight to state the importance of the district working closely with the PTAs in each school and stressing the importance that this group has on each of our schools. Uh, your PTA volunteers are your boots on the ground. Although I can only speak for Tatum School, I know that each of our schools has a thriving and very involved PTA that works tirelessly to help our school community. There are active volunteers in our school daily helping with recess, lunch, book nooks, special interest groups, and so much more. Many of these volunteers also have full-time jobs and are spending their lunch hours or breaks doing what they can do to help. I could spend five minutes up here telling you that we beg and plead for volunteers and never have enough hands or productive voices, but that's not why I'm here to talk, to take your time up today. I'm here begging and pleading with the board and the district to work hand in hand with these critical helpers in our community. Without volunteers and PTAs, our schools can't be what they are today. The district is not making it easy or feasible for Tatum School to get additional projects completed. Please know we are not asking for funding or help with the district. We're simply asking for an okay to proceed with projects. I'm going on month three of trying to get an approval or at least a conversation about a project that will make a huge positive impact on an outdoor classroom for our school. Tatum has the most kids per elementary school and looking with a blind eye, it seems like possibly the smallest outdoor area. So any and all improvements would be beneficial. By ignoring PTAs, you're discouraging volunteers and the last thing our schools, teachers, students, and staff need are less people helping. I know there is a lot going on in our district, but I encourage you to bring the conversation to the here and now and not necessarily the vision from three years from now by doing this, there's a chance that you'll still have active participation in our schools in the future. There's an ongoing request for daily help in our schools, but absolutely no reciprocation of helping hands when it's there is something the PTA would like to do to use their fundraising money to improve our community. There should be a standing agenda item that addresses PTA items and ongoing conversation with the board and the volunteers in our school. Thank you for your time and your space to voice my concerns. So I'm not seeing anyone else um, get up, so I wanted to take a moment just to thank everyone who took the time to come out on a Monday evening um, and share their thoughts and concerns with us on a variety of topics tonight. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, moving on to section 17, is there a motion to adjourn this evening? So moved. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>